join me for an opening prayer, and then I'm going to give just a short update. Grace and Father, we come to you this morning. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We ask for your blessing on our church and our community and our state and our nation and the world. We ask you to have the Holy Spirit just consume this building this morning. And let everybody understand the power that you give us. Lord, we ask you to be with the band this morning. With Randall after a while when he comes to give us a message. Thank you for your sending your son to die on the cross for us, for your leadership, your direction, and your guidance. In Jesus' name I pray. Just want to give a real short update and then get out of the way. Uh, the elders have been busy by email. That's common nowadays, in case everybody knows that's how you meet. And we're moving forward quickly, in my opinion to at least finalize a search committee. And that has been difficult because there's so many quality, valuable people in this or in this church to try to narrow down to five or six people who represent us for a, a, a search committee. But we're going to try to meet briefly after church today, hopefully get to that uh, to get to that final final group. The uh, and of course we'll need to Make sure they know they're in that group. The uh, two updates I want to give, I was sharing with Ron and the judge one ago. This past week, I've had two very good conversations. One with the senior pastor at Texoma Cowboy Church. He's very helpful, very uh, knowledgeable about what's going on with cowboy churches in the state. Uh, his exact words that I enjoyed so much, when I said, you know, if you have any ideals or any recommendations, he said, well, I will pray about it and get back with you. I enjoyed that. And so I expect him. He also offered that he has, I think, three people on staff. And if we need to fill in some Sundays, that he knew they'd be glad to drive over here and, and give us a message and, and fellowship with us. And then Friday afternoon, I had a great conversation with a young man who works for the Texas Baptist Association. And he has helped in the past start some cowboy churches. And then when he went to work for the Texas Baptist Association, one of his jobs is to be develop the history of cowboy churches in Texas. And so he's very knowledgeable. We are on his list. He knows very well about Western Trail Cowboy Churches on his list of 197 churches that he's found that the Texas Baptist Association helped, helped uh, found cowboy churches, 197. So he also is going to be a very good resource to help get the word out. And then he also offered to come some Sunday and give the message as well. So very interesting week as I talk to different people. I want to give you that update and have you keep praying for our, the elders and the search committee and our, our next pastor. Thank you. Uh, we need a nursery help. Teenagers. We're going to have one or two people that wind up helping in the nursery, and that's taxing them a little too much. So if you have a little time, it'll take 30 minutes out of the Sunday to maybe every other Sunday, every Thursday Sunday, you might come in the nursery. Also, next Sunday, the 18th, we're having a little shindig in honor of Ronald the truck. Um, I'm, we're gonna have the fly set up out here. It's not gonna be the chuck wagon, but it's gonna be close to a chuck wagon. And uh, I'm thinking they're gonna drink a little coffee out there that morning, and then Strand is gonna come speak, Strand Smith. And then after the message, we're gonna have a barbecue. And then they asked me if we were gonna dance. I don't know, we might, you never know. But don't forget, next Sunday, the 18th, we want everybody here and everybody else that's not here, here. Okay, and if you haven't been here before, if you need a book, go underneath your seat. Yes. Yeah, I meant to announce that. If you, if some of you would please bring some desserts, uh, salads, cakes, pies, whatever, that would be great. That would be great. We think we have a deal going on, but we're not sure, so let's just take the other road. What about it, Virginia? That work? 
Okay, sounds good. So don't forget the book is under your seat so you can sing along with us. Page 169. 169.
be a wonderful size. Come into the Sunday school classrooms at any time. I am telling you right now, we have some of the best kids on the planet that ever was. I don't know about you all. My kids were always bad for me and good for everybody else. Well, that's your, okay? That's your, so it's great. It's just a great experience this morning. Um, everybody will look at me, okay? You know, we talked about something this morning in, in class, and we had a really good class this morning. I'm going to tell you a story again that I know you've heard before, but there's one line that I want to pull out and talk about, okay? You know, at the Western Cowboy, Western Trail Cowboy Church in Sunday School, we teach that the Bible is the God-breathed, inspired Word of God. It's not to be added to. It's not to be taken away from. And yes, ma'am, clap for that because I think that's exactly how it should be. <laughs> and I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about another word that I know you've heard in school, and it's multiply. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, you're going to do a little math. Let me read this story and review this story for you, and then I want to pull out one line. And, and remind us how important this is in the, the lesson I know God intended to put on our hearts. It said, Jesus and his disciples were tired. They needed a quiet place to rest. So they got into a boat and pushed off from the shore. A crowd followed the boat. Over 5,000 people had come to see Jesus. Even though he was tired, Jesus wanted to help them. He climbed out of the boat and he began to bless and heal many people. Later that day, the disciples said to Jesus, It's getting late. These people should go home and eat dinner. Jesus replied, We can feed them. See if anyone has any food to share. The disciples found one boy. He had five loaves of bread and two small fish. Jesus said, Bring the boy to me. The disciples asked, how will so little food feed this many people? That would be me. I would be looking for the problem. Jesus said, you'll see. Have the people sit down. Then Jesus took the bread and gave thanks to God. His disciples gave bread and fish to everyone. To their surprise, 12 baskets were left over. Now, look at it. There's one line of this very familiar story that I want to I want to point out to you. It said Jesus took the bread, even though there were only five loaves with five thousand people, and gave thanks to God. Folks, let me tell you about about something about the Bible. Every line there is a lesson. In every line there is a lesson, and the lesson from this story is is that when we are grateful, when we give thanks to God. Whatever we have, no matter how small it is, multiplies. When Jesus gave thanks for what little he had, and I believe that was an example to us, because everything Jesus said and did was an example to us. When he gave thanks for the little that he had, all of a sudden he had more than enough. So let's remember as we go that we need to be thankful and grateful for everything that we have, no matter though it may seem it's very small, it will actually, in the end, be more than enough for what we need. All right? Let's remember that this week. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity today for this church, for all the wonderful people here, the families. Bless all their needs and, and bless these children, Lord, because this is this is what it's about. And in your words, these children and, and bring them closer to you. Just continue to bless us. Jesus' name, I don't know if any of y'all caught Keesley dragging Gatlin down the hall. That was probably the keys thing I've ever seen. She had her by the hand and she was just pulling her all the way up. Good job, girls. <laughs>
sure most of you know that we lost a very precious lady this week that's been attending our church since our inspection, I think, pretty close. Miss Benita Lane. She is a wonderful lady. She lived 97 two years. She was always good to our band. If we ever needed something, she'd ask me, Lady, I don't need anything. I said, Well, we could use one. This or that or the other. She always told us to give us a donation for our band. She's going to be with us.
Um, you see, I'm, I'm an alcoholic. Um, as of last Monday, I have five clean years. get to thinking about it and I was 45 when I got sober uh, April the 5th 2016 that's something a day I'll always remember and always carry with me but I look back and you know I was 45 years old and I got to thinking oh, Lord, I, I've spent better than 30 years <laughs> drinking doing other stuff, things that I'm not proud of, things that I shouldn't have done. I had a lot of it, a lot of people didn't know. I mean, uh, you know, I guess, you know, it, it never was easy, and I guess I made it hard on myself, but I didn't think I was. I was having fun, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, we start out, High school, 15, you know, you're a freshman, running around with older guys. And you, you start drinking. Um, you know, you get into college, you start doing things, running around, you're free. You don't have your parents there telling you what to do all the time, so you take advantage of it. You know, that's a lot of people you talk to, they say, well, you know, what, what happened if you have a you know, had a bad life growing up was a reason for it. No, you know, if there was anything that one thing my mama tried to do, she always did the best she could to keep me from it. Made me not to. Tried to put curfews on me. I was one of those that just, I wasn't going to do that. Uh, you know, I, I'd done a lot of things that, you know, Let's see. Most of you know me. I get like I said. I've had a lot of stuff. Um, I was actually I've been arrested five times. Uh, three for DUIs. Uh, two times for disorderly conduct. Um, you know, three marriages. That that speaks a lot for somebody, doesn't it? Um, You know, you, you, you look back, I mean, God, I mean, y'all, the last few weeks when I've known I was going to do this, I lay there in bed, I, I go thinking, golly, I did that, I did that. There's things that you, that come back to you that, that you really don't remember that you did. It was a, it was all hidden. And then, you know, I always blame somebody else for things happening. You know, Mark, I guess when my second marriage ended, it was really hard on me because I had a five-year-old son. But it wasn't my fault, was it? Yeah, it was. Because I couldn't quit. I couldn't quit the drinking. Um, I wouldn't go home because I was drinking. There have been countless times that I've tried to quit. If I had a nickel every time I've tried to quit, I'd be a rich man right now. Um, my brother and I was talking about it the other day, and he said, you know, he said, I, I won't ever forget. He said, Susan called me one night, and, you know, you have laid off drinking for a while. I said, she hadn't come home yet. And he said, so I went where I thought she was. And he said, there you were beside your pickup and passed out. Um, you know, a lot of you have helped me out through that. Got me back home. Got me places I need to be where I was safe because I couldn't keep myself safe. Um, you know, there have been a lot of times where that happened. I mean, pulled up to the house. Two hours later, somebody comes out and gets me out of the pickup because I can't get out. But I developed a need for it for some reason. 
I don't know why, but it gets a hold of you. You know, when I'm growing up, I've tried all sorts of things. One thing I didn't ever try was, you know, I never tried cocaine. I never tried heroin or anything like that because I'm deathly afraid of needles. There's no way I'm going to stick a needle in me to try to feel good. That's just going to run like that. Um, but then, you know, you keep going and you keep going down that road. Why? I don't know. I never knew. And it was always somebody else's fault. You know, there was always reasons. There's always a reason to drink, either when you're happy or when you're sad. You know, it's not like, of course, of course now they're trying to make all kinds of drugs legal, which is ridiculous. But you know, alcohol is something that's right in front of you all the time. It's legal. You know, you, you walk into a store, it's there. You see commercials on TV. Every other commercial you see on TV is alcohol, seems like. You know, and it keeps getting worse. It keeps getting worse. You know, it started out, you know, you go out and drink with friends. Yeah, let's go have a good time. And then it gets to where it gets more. You're always wanting more. And you don't know why. You just go through it. Then it gets more a hold of you. You go, well, okay. <coughs> Sometimes you brag about it. You know, hey, I drink 12 pack. I drink this much. I drink you under the table. And I did. I could. You know, and then, then it gets to where it's not just in the evenings. I got to where, you know, even before I quit, I mean, 20 years in, when I was 30, 25. For some reason, I could always drink. I could always drink a lot. And I always had it with me, for some reason. You know, you socialize with friends. You think, well, I drank more than you did. Got to be a game, for some reason. But then it gets a hold of you more. It gets a hold of you more, and for some reason, there's something pulling you towards that. Pulling me, pulling why? I don't know. You keep going, you keep going, then you wake up one day and you realize I've got to have this. I got to where I was starting earlier. You know, work for myself, work by myself most of the time. I could. Nobody there to check. Check on me, you know, keep me in check. And then anyway, I wasn't doing a good enough job myself keeping myself in check because then it got where I was starting in the morning. And then it got to where it was, you know, most of y'all know where I live. It takes me about three to five minutes to get to the highway, from my house to the highway. I'd always make sure the night before I had some in my cooler. That way I could make it through the next day. I'd have two beers before I could even get to the highway, just so I could make sure I could make it this day. This was six o'clock in the morning. And I would start. And then I would, you know, run over to the different side of town each time, get a beer here, go to the store here there. I got to the point where I was drinking all day long. That was it. Then I was pretty active in several different organizations. There were times when I couldn't drink. So I started using paint pills. Mixing those. That really wasn't good. It was at the time, but it wasn't good for me. Not good for my health, because I guess about five years before I quit, about 10 years ago, I started having stomach problems. And I 
boy just about well, I'm just sick. I stay sick for a few days, fever. Finally, I ended up going to the doctor, and you know, they gave me pain pills and was like, well, I'd, I'd stock up on that. Then I got to get worse, more frequent. Finally, I went to the doctor and they ran some tests and they said, Fitz, you know, you're showing a lot of signs of pancreatitis. Where your pancreas is trying to shut down on you. You're going to have to slow up on what you're doing because, you know, we can tell you've been drinking this morning even while you're sick and you can smell it. And that's one good thing. The one thing about it is that I always laughed about it. I kept anti the bush and I kept Ravings going with business. But I always tried to mask it, but you never could. You think you can. And now as I'm sober, <laughs> that's something you really can't hide because I can smell I can smell somebody coming through that door up there right now. But it kept getting worse. It kept getting worse. Mm. My wife, Christy, say, you're going to have to quit. You're going to, you're going to have to slow down. All right, I will. One day, I'm fine now. I feel better. And then I started to get drinking more, get drinking more. You know, I got where I was going to do a 30 pack plus a day, plus pain pills, plus whiskey. Plus anything I can get my hands on. I don't I sit there at night. Everybody else in the house go to bed. I'd sit there and I'd, if I had a six pack of refrigerator, I'd sit there until it was gone. Then I'd go to bed. One day I got that uh, we had I guess it was about the middle of March in 2016. I'd started early as usual, got going, and got a phone call. We had some cows out, so I'm over there. I really wasn't feeling good. But I went on anyway, and I didn't take a horse with me or anything like that. And I got walking through a wheat field, trying to get some cattle back around where they needed to go. Started getting lightheaded. Then I had to run. I didn't help. I collapsed. My brother found me. Got me to the hospital. You know, my blood pressure was 220 over 160. So I stayed there for quite a while, got everything lined out, got me home, got on the couch when I got home and all that, laid up for a day or two. Uh, I've always had a heart doctor because that kind of, that stuff runs in my family. Uh, Christy got me an appointment a couple of days later, I had everything checked out, everything was fine. He said, you just got some high blood pressure, you need to slow down on this, you know, slow down on what you're doing. And then you start getting some rest or take care of yourself, that'll help you. He said, you're only 45. Yeah, I'm fine. Do you know what that's doing to stop me? We stopped at 8 when I left Dallas after going to the doctor. And I had three beers sitting there waiting on dinner while somebody sitting across from me saying, you really don't need to do that. You don't tell me what to do. It's me. It's, it's me. I can take care of me. Don't tell me. Let it help. We got back home, got going again, and um, probably one of the Days that I was really maddest in my entire life is when she called me and said, It's, you know, it's about 10 o'clock in the morning. She said, I need you to come back home. She said, I've got 
something wrong here at the house. I can't remember what she said. I pulled up. She was on the front porch. My dad and my brother came around behind the house. I said, what the hell are y'all doing? We need to talk to you. Fine. Let's hear it again. I got to quit this, right? You want me to quit that? Well, like I said, 10 o'clock in the morning, I was already six beers in. And Christy said, I found a place for you to go. You need some help. She said, you need to go to rehab where I'm going. I said, why are you going to rehab? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that well that one. <laughs> and so while we were sitting there, I, I agreed to I said, okay, fine. I'll go. Make you happy. I'll go. And she gave me a number to call. I called the place. It's a place in Abilene. Um, and I told them, well, okay, I got several things to do. I won't be gone for a month. I got stuff I got to take care of. So I went running around. You know what I did? I went drinking. But I'm still, still taking care of my stuff. One thing, one thing that's really weird is I can drink that much because I still remember mostly. There were times late in the evening I'd forget that I was, I could function. A functioning alcoholic, I guess what you call it. But I made the Made my rounds and everything. I got a call that evening from the the rehab center. And they asked me a lot of questions. I was on the phone for about an hour. They said, well, when we have a, a bed available, we'll call you. Because there's a wait list. Said so it could be, you know, a couple of days. It could be two weeks. I got up the next morning. <coughs> that, that next morning, when they called Said, can you be here by two? Yeah. Yeah, I can. So I packed up a week's worth of clothes, went my pickup out, went by and told Christy I was going, and I left. I got to Austin Center on Main Street. I stopped and I got me an 18 pack. And I finished that before I got to Abilene. I pulled up out there across the street, parked my pickup, walked in, I signed my papers, and I was there. Scariest day of my life, but the best day of my life. Almost. They took me in, did my registration, blood pressure, which was high. Alcohol leads to high blood pressure. It really makes your blood pressure go up a lot. Um, and they had to do a breathalyzer test. And I was three times a week of living. And I drove myself down there. How? How did I make it there? Just like I did every day. I made it through somehow. Got checked in, little room. The bed, not stand, no lamp, no nothing. Man, it's gonna be bright in here. Two days later, I woke up. Other than them coming in, checking on me every two hours, taking my blood pressure. I went into detox for five days. You're away from everybody else that's going through their counseling phase. You can get dried out, cleaned up. <laughs> and I got looking around, and there's snacks at work. See, alcohol's a, a sugar, and there's sugar there. Oh, another thing, when I checked in, um, they weighed me. I weighed 128 pounds. I'm not a big guy, but 128 pounds, that's pretty thin. I weigh 168 now. Um, we were sitting there watching TV one day and there was 
I don't even remember what was on with me and another guy that was there at the detox. We got talking, and I mean, all of a sudden, something just hit me. And I just sit there, and, and I don't know, I've told this before to a couple of friends. I've never given my testimony to a group like this. I did it one time in front of a uh, group not too long ago that a good friend of mine asked me to give my story to, and I appreciate that. But there was something that just made me freeze. So cold, but it was so hot at the same time. Something clicked. And I know now what it was. Something told me that there's somebody that has been knew where I was the whole time that I needed to find him. And right then, I found him. You know, good Lord came to me that day and came to me hard. I ended up going on through my classes. Um, we worked, uh, it was a faith based organization that works off here, does the 12 steps, do AA. Um, That was good, you know. I, I couldn't have asked for a better place to be in my life at that time. Somebody placed me there, and I realized that I wasn't there for Christy or my dad or my brother or my mother. I went down there for them, but I realized that, well, boy, this is your, you better be here for you. And I made my mind up I was there for me. It was time for me to make a change, and the only reason I got that in my thick skull is because the Spirit came to me. Good Lord said, You better quit, son. You're going to have to quit. I've got something for you to do. I don't know what it is. Still don't know what it is. But he's got something for me to do. Went through my counselor, named Jamie. Saved my life. Uh, I ended up reconfirming. That's something I've got to read right here that I got when I reconfirmed my faith that this doesn't come off. It's not going to take it off. Um, I got food and I got home, which was different. I was scared, but I was alive. I was felt good. And you know it's it's not easy being sober. Because you've always had something to turn to to take that away. You know, in the last five years, a lot of things have happened. Been through bankruptcy. Sold out a lot of my stuff on board and made a career change. Got a divorce. A lot of that stuff would drive people over the edge, make them drink. Either where they're sad, mad, or in some of those cases, happy. <laughs> um, the one thing about it is. I've decided not to turn to that. Because I've got something better to turn to. I used to get so mad, so impatient. Something didn't go right, I'd just, I'd throw a fit, I'd break stuff. I'd, break a hand, I'd break, you know, anything. You know, the, it, just little things like the wind blowing too hard, you can't get a dead gum gate shut. Run it back and forth, run it back and forth. Now I've got the burn this mm. Lord help me through this. You call. I used to hold grudges against people. I get so mad, I'd hold it. 
Do you know what I've learned? Forgive. It's not my place to judge people. It's my only place I've only got to judge myself. The only other person that's going to, that's, that's to judge anybody is God. When we get there, hopefully we'll get there. I realize now I've got a place. And I'm going to be up there one day as long as I keep doing what I'm doing. There's lots of times, you know, that people say, well, you know, you live alone. Who you say you can't drink? Nobody knows. <laughs> yeah, I know. He know. I made a promise to him. I made a promise to myself. Uh, I guess one thing that really made me realize that I had to quit, that I had to turn my faith, myself back over to God, it wasn't I lost him or he lost me, I lost him. I never turned to him, I always turned to the other. But, you know, I've got a 19 year old son now. That was losing faith to me. I wasn't being the example I needed to be for him. They got to where he wasn't wanting to come around. I don't blame him. I wouldn't want to sit there and watch my dad drink himself to death. But it's made a lot of difference. He's actually chasing the faith himself too. He just, he's a Marine. I talked to him quite a bit. When I'm mailing, I'd send him little quotes in his Bible, Scripture. And one day when he wrote me back, he said, thanks for these. He said, I've been using them in a prayer group. Kind of funny. You know how things turn. You know, he gets to work. He doesn't want to be there around you to, you know, wow, this is something I can use. I've seen what it's done to Dad both ways. Plus, of uh, the devil's work. Why? I don't know. Why am I dead? I don't know. Maybe it's just to help somebody else. Hopefully I do. I've had quite a few people I talk to. I've got some good friends that, that have been down the same road that we we talk sometimes, whether it's all the time or very seldom, but you still it takes that reaffirming each other that helps more than anything. Uh, I've had people ask me. How'd you do it? I've got somebody that's having a really hard time that can't quit. How'd you do it? You can't make them. I'm going to tell you right now, you cannot make an alcoholic or addict quit. The only way they'll ever quit is when they make up their own time. That's going to be the only way to do it. And when they make up their mind, and they allow God to come back into their heart like he did me, that's the only way it's going to happen. Which, you know, thankfully I did. I've had a lot of people tell me, you know, I can never do. Well, you know what? I didn't either. I didn't know I had that problem. 
And what's wrong with me? I didn't have any problem drinking. But it was a problem. It was a problem in my own life because I was not connected to God. It's the only reason I'm still here. And for all the things that I've done, all the wrong things I've done, all the things I've, you know, can't even say, don't want to say. You know, he sent his son to die on the cross for us. That blood was shed for us to forgive our sins. And we'll have a place with him as long as we do not deny him. Never gonna do that again. I'm too too steady right now. A lot of times I don't think I am. How am I gonna get through this, get to tomorrow? So you know what? It's just one day at a time. One day at a time. I thank God each morning for allowing me to wake up. Allow me to get through the day clear minded. And I thank Him each night before I go to bed for a sober day. And I thank Him for the blessings He's bestowed on me to be sober. Is it easy? No, it's not. So I won't give, tell you the same thing I'm telling you right now. It's not easy to stay that way. But. Good Lord made a commitment to us and it's time to make a commitment to him and I have it. Um, I want to say thank you to all the friends and family that are here today. <laughs> made a difference. I want to thank you for the prayers. You know, I actually couldn't do it without this place. You know, when I got home from rehab, I was supposed to find a church through kind of my protocol you're supposed to go through, and I didn't. I went three years without ever finding a home. There's always something came up, but I realized that I'm going to slip back into a place I shouldn't be if I don't find some people to get with. Friends and family, let's just say family. I'll say that because y'all are my family. So two years ago, I got here and, <laughs> you know, nobody judges. Nobody, nobody blinks an eye. And I appreciate that. And I want to thank each and every one of y'all for being here today and the continued support that you, you've given me and those that have dealt with it too. So that's my story. <laughs> it's been a long road, but you know what? There's going to be a long road ahead that's got a whole lot better path to go down than what I was on in the past. And I'm looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to it. Tell them I was closing a quick prayer. God, I want to thank you today. Again, thank you for another beautiful day that you've given us. I want to thank you for these smiling faces here today. Thank you for allowing me to give my story to them. Hopefully someone else that needs you, that needs to hear this story heard it. God, I, just, I ask that you just lead us through each day. Lead us where we're pleasing to you, where others may see you through us. And Lord, as we go about our way today, let us be steadfast. Let us follow in your glory. One thing, Lord, I just ask that you send spring this way. God, I just want to thank you again for another day that you've given me that's not promised. For it's in your name, your son Jesus Christ, name I pray. Amen.